Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Enfield Voices. Now, what we're going to do today is look at how local authorities approach the issue of climate change and sustainability. Lots of local authorities across the UK and across the globe, in fact, have uh, declared climate emergencies, but they have all done it in different ways. And some of them have done it very superficially, but some of them have done it in a way that you can develop indicators of success. Now we're going to look at one model and it's a model called Donut Economics, which was developed by a lady called Kate Rawworth. Uh, and she's written a book called Donut Economics. Now, one of the areas in the UK that's pioneered this and it's doing this, so, you know, it's interesting to talk to them, is Cornwall. And we've got Alex Rainbow here today, who's going to tell us about that. He's an officer in Cornwall. And we may even have someone else joining us from Cornwall, Mark Holmes. Uh, but we'll wait and see. That's the sort of surprise. We'll, we'll see if he comes on. Anyhow, um, Alex, thank you for you for joining us, and uh, it's great that you're here. Um, could you start by telling us about your role in Cornwall and what it is you do? Right, yeah, so um, I am a, a carbon assessment officer in the carbon neutral Cornwall team uh, at Cornwall Council. So my role, is, my role is, is twofold. One side of it is to look at our uh, projects and policies and how they're developed and uh, if necessary, do carbon modeling for them. So what are our emissions tied to things and that helps us with our decision-making. And the other half uh, for the last year has been to help develop and embed the decision wheel tool that we have, which is what Francis is referring to here in terms of our effective embodiment of donut economics into our decision-making system. So that's, okay. that's, that's where I am. Okay, so you 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 do that job and you are trying to develop what you call a donut decision will. Why have you chosen that particular model? What was the sort of inspiration behind it for you? Um, Mark would be able to answer this one better, but uh, it was, but I, I do have some, some background in it. Um, I wasn't part of the strategy team when it was developed. However, when we'd started developing this tool there was no uh cons I there was no concerted decision to bring donut economics to the to the center of our decision making processes and to, to sort of evaluate our work through this originally we designed a, a basic version of this tool as a, as a practical impact assessment for um, some very specific stuff around housing and this was uh just sort of the inspiration of someone who's now currently on our team uh but once we developed it uh, we saw that there was there generally a potential for for taking the the tool, the idea of the tool and its graphic representation. And Kate Rayworth does this so well in terms of donor economics. It gives us a really good graphical representation of how to uh, how to sort of assess the impacts of, of of the decisions that we make in terms of our ecological overshoot and our and our social undershoot and where we're where we're not finding that balance between providing enough for a social foundation and not exceeding our, our ecological ceiling and sort of dividing that into sectors and it produces this wonderful graphic and we we realized at the time that this might be a way to actually uh finally in some coherent way incorporate a lot of the different areas that we wanted to into decision making uh, that we weren't really doing before so things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions or, or or a lot of various social justice indicators um, or, or wider environmental ones, or, which, as I said, we, we weren't, there was no codified way of, of, of testing our decisions against them. And this provided us with a model to, to, to allow us to do that. Um, uh, it, maybe if I put up the will, you can explain to people, because some people will know about Kate Raworth, some people will have no idea, and when they <coughs> talk about donuts, they think of going down to Krispy Kreme. <laughs> so maybe if I just put it up, and you could then um, just explain what the donut will is. Sure, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's a good one. So, um, so yeah, Kate, Kate Rayworth. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a fantastic theory, and uh, she's an economist. And um, this was an economic theory that she developed uh, as an opposition to sort of linear economics, where we measure everything by sort of economic growth, and we don't really factor in a lot of the the more long term thinking um, that 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 goes into trying to create a sustainable economic development model. So this was this is her 
this is her take on what a sustainable uh, economic development model is. And what it what it is, uh, basically, it says that that if we want to provide for ourselves and live a, a, a sort of a comfortable life uh, or provide a social foundation, as she refers to it, we have to do some level of harm to the world. We have to extract resources from it um, if we're going to be able to to, to continue develop continue developing in a sort of just and, and fair way but that the planet itself has has these sort of boundaries over which if we cross them we're no longer doing this sustainably and the world is on is unable to su support that financially that sort of economic and social development so finding a space between these two this safe and just space for humanity um is sort of the aim of this uh, uh the aim of 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 donor economics and it's to look at all the various factors that that are outlined here or whatever set of factors you want to to look at but these are the original kate rayworth ones to look at those and see where as a society we are either not providing enough to meet our social foundation create creating a, a life that people want to lead or we are in the process overshooting our ecological ceiling and at some point this is no longer going to be sustainable and we actually damage our ability in the future to develop economically so uh, you can see there on the particular illustration I put there where the overshoots are, and it's where the overshoots are that people have concern. Um, okay, so you, you've shown what the model is, and you've talked about it, haven't you, in some of your websites and so on, as an alternative to a, a linear economy. What does that mean? Uh, right, so, so in a, a linear economy... Um, and I'm no econ economist, uh, um, economist, I can't even pronounce it. I'm no um, economist, but a linear economy is one where the principal measure of what of, of, of success is something like GDP or economic growth. And it doesn't really take into account all of the rest of the factors. And it's a sort of a, generally a more short term approach that, that looks at those sort of immediate returns. And those are traditionally found by extracting materials, using them and disposing them in this, this sort of linear fa fashion. And then we progress um, in, in theory, we progress economically, getting richer and richer and richer, but we're ignoring all of the sort of long term things that are going to come back to bite us in the behind. Like if we destroy our biosphere, for example, that's that's not going to do well for things like future agricultural production. If, if for example, if we're changing the climate, this is an example of it. Um, and, and that's going to lead to a lot of economic stagnation and eventually collapse. So donor economics is a way of just saying we need to we need to check all this just to make sure we, and we need to in some way um, attach a value to these things that we haven't traditionally attached the value to, like the sea. OK, <laughs> OK. So what you're trying to do is make sure all the services that Cornwall does does not impinge on the planetary constraints of sustainability in a number of areas. Um, and you look at housing and you look at education and you look at all the services that you do and you try to make sure they do not shoot out over those planetary constraints. Um, so you've designed it, haven't you, to make sure that the net impacts of decisions um, are in all those areas. Now, how have you defined those areas? If you just take what Kate Rawworth has said, or have you looked at the particular areas on the inside of the donut, the services that you deliver, and identified key ones that you want to measure? So, the, the, the I'll, I'll just take it back a, a little bit. The, the, the tool that we've designed isn't quite designed to look at where we are overshooting or where we are undershooting. That's a, that's a much more complicated thing. And we are working on a project with uh, Exeter University to do that, where they are assessing where we are. But the tool that we developed, we wanted something that we could test a decision that we wanted to make against whether it would be harmful or beneficial in, in, in the areas we identified. So to, to adapt Kate Rayworth's model, we looked at the, the the zones that she had, or the segments of the wheel that she had, and we thought, um, if we want to turn this into a tool that people in the council can use, we've got to adapt it so that anyone can sort of understand it. And there are a lot of titles in there which might be a little confusing to people. They're not necessarily straightforward ones that people would get. So, so to a degree, we adapted them in sort of nomenclature. Further to that. We looked at what our principal policy drivers were, um, you know, things like environmental growth is a key policy for us, uh, and where we have power to affect change in some way, and what 
many of our major strategic decisions and, and even practical project related decisions, what areas they could influence and what we wanted to, to, to make sure that we were getting right. And so we adapted it, added new segments into it. Um, so things like renewable energy, that's not in the, in the original one, but because it's something that is a really key thing for us to develop, our projects need to, to sort of pick up on that and make that a separate thing rather than just sort of lumping it in with climate change. And also it's something like climate change adaptation, which is another key area we're moving into. We wanted to add that in. So it's all, it's, it's all sort of a, adapted from that original model, but, but the way that we use it is slightly different from how Kate Rayworth envisioned using donor economics to plan long-term economic trends. Yeah, well, she says that people will use it in different ways. Um, and, and you've used it to look at different projects, haven't you? I mean, there's a thing called the Saints Trail, um, and you've developed a will for that as well. I think I actually do have a um, picture of that. I hope I've got the right one. Do you want to explain what the Saints Trail is and how you've used that model for that? Grand, yes. Uh, so the Saints Trail is a series of um, uh, bike bike lanes, uh, cycle trails. Let's let, let's put it that way. Uh, that that cut across the the Cornish landscape. The idea is that they are uh, in part something that we want people to use as sort of an educational, recreational, and health related thing. But also in they also improves the cycle infrastructure across Cornwall so that people can get around rather than having to rely on cars so much. And it, it, it sort of skips across both of those, those different areas. This particular version of the wheel is, is right back to our very, very first one that we had. And it's not largely changed from what Kay Rayworth had, had put in. It, it's developed quite away from there, but this, this essentially is, is, is close to what it looks like now. Um, how we used it, uh, and this is, this is our, our initial use of this wheel was for our highest level strategic decisions, so our cabinet level decisions, anything that was sort of quite big that needed a that needed full cabinet to go in and, and assess it and make a decision. This would be used uh, at the end of the project and policy planning phase to demonstrate the impact that we were having across these areas and provide that this is a sort of summary to the, the decision makers as to what impacts we expected to see. In the case of the Saints Trail, uh, this meant uh, we've got all of our all of our, our impacts there um so we expected it to sort of lower greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution by bringing down the number of car journeys for those people who are going to be using it for transportation rather than recreation um we thought it would pr improve uh in the, in the inner wheel improve access to services that's what connectivity is about um it might provide a few jobs probably not but not very many um, and better access to the local environment, which is what that one is, and some associated health benefits from people having better exercise to out or better access to outdoor exercise. We figured it would it would be quite good for education as well because we wanted to put educational stuff on the trails, talking about the history of the area. Um, and uh, but it but it also would come with some potential negatives. So we're cutting, for example, like these Saint trails are going through areas where we're converting some wild or managed land into cycle parts so there's some level of biodiversity loss like fragmentation habitat fragmentation trying to minimize it and we also we also thought well this could provide an, a, a sort of a route for criminals to move between areas that they couldn't traditionally do so before so there was a possible impact on community safety through putting in these and how we use the wheel is that is that behind each of these segments there are a series of questions that, that we ask. So for example, with air pollution, one of the questions that we'll ask is, will this lead to a permanent or temporary rise or fall in the number of vehicle journeys if we go ahead with this project? And you know, with a associated negative or positive, more car journeys being bad because it leads to more air pollution and less being good. So there's a lot of these questions. It's usually between one and six questions per segment that people will ask themselves and as i said our newer version of this wheel does look a, a little different from this okay the, um, the the other thing is that you thought the will would be good for tackling climate justice didn't you i mean there are quite a lot of areas of poverty in cornwall and you wanted a climate change strategy that dealt with that and you think the will is an adequate way of doing that no uh no not not at all the the, the wheel is uh is, is something that sort of sits slightly apart from our climate change strategy. We did, we, we have a climate change action plan that we published and 
one of the 123 actions that were listed in it, I think it's 123, uh, was to develop this wheel because it was it was a way of codifying the need to examine the climate change impact of any decision into the major decision making process. So it's it's a little part of it. Our climate change action program is much much broader than this, but this is one little aspect of it. And to be honest, we effectively tagged this into into our climate change action pro program. Sort of tagged it onto it. Um, one because it's it, it's useful, but but two because um, despite the fact that the vast majority of the wheel is not about climate change, um, although obviously everything is interlinked and climate change will have a big impact across many areas. It's not really explicitly about climate change, but we tagged it on there because climate change is a really great way to sell what you need to do at, at the moment. Um, so, it was, so it was sort of initially branded a climate change wheel, despite the fact that it's not very focused on, on climate change. Um, if you have, if, if you have, you're working with the University of Exeter, as you say, and if they develop quite good measurement metrics, indicators, then it does become fairly central to climate change, doesn't it? Because then you have some idea of your success. Uh, yes. So that 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 is a that is a separate that is a separate project where they are looking. The say University of Exeter are looking much more directly at the the, the sort of more Kate Rayworth centric version of the wheel, where they're measuring how we're doing. Whereas the tool that we have is really just to prefer, just to provide a graphic. Or like a, it, it gets people to look at decisions through a lot of different lenses that they wouldn't before. One of which is climate change, but there are many, many other ways to 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 look at, at, at that. That's quite interesting because it's almost like you're doing a step by step incremental approach. I mean, you have you have climate change strategy, you have the the, the decision will, but if you work with Exeter and so on, you can actually bring your local authority to make it a very comprehensive approach to tackling the problem. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've, we've enjoyed a long and fruitful um, collaboration with them. They have a, an environmental and sustainability school about 10 minutes from my house here in Penryn, which makes things a, a little bit easier. And uh, we have a lot of cross-funded projects. We're working at the moment on another tool, which is looking, uh, it's a demonstrator at the moment, but it's looking at um, climate change adaptation specifically. So not mitigation, the, but because this is an area that we haven't really got policy developed in, we don't have a good evidence base. The fact is we don't even really know what climate change will do exactly in Cornwall, like what, what we expect climate change to do. So part of what they're doing is modeling it to give us the information to, for us to be able to start factoring that into our policy decisions going forward, because we don't, we don't really know what the effects are. <laughs> but that, that's interesting because I mean, lots of local authorities do climate change policies and it's all based on mitigation and there's no adaption. And in some cases, there's no climate justice. There's no whole borough or whole county policy. So, you know, working with Exeter on the, 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 the donut model, it helps you to provide a basis for that, which is good. But your councillors, how did you sell it to them? Because if I were to go to some councillors and say, right, we're going to have a donut economics model, they'll say, well, they have, they laugh <laughs> and they send you down to go shopping for donuts and all those sort of jokes. So how do you sell it to them? How did you get them on board and so that they could use it within the context of their own decision making? Well, firstly, firstly, we didn't go to them and say we want to adopt donut economics <laughs> because we would have got exactly that reaction. There's, there's no two ways about it. It's a trendy term, it feels like. Maybe less so than it was a couple of years ago, but it's still a, quite a trendy term. So what we went to them with was uh, what we went to them with was the tool itself once we developed it because ultimately really what it does is it gives them this really sort of easy to access um easy to understand window into the potential impacts of the decisions that they're making from a much broader set of rate of perspectives than they previously were used to and they really like this this the, but the, it, we didn't say so we didn't go down there with some grand presentation about how we're going to change economic theory we just we use the tool um, as a way of bringing donut economics into a sort of practical thing that they could get their hands on, and they and and you know, and it's it's a rag rated thing as well. The, the version we use at the moment has like red, orange, grey, light green, and dark green, and everybody just gets that. And so we we've changed the a lot of the titles so they'll things that, so they'll be easier to understand. Like like ocean health is what we have instead of ocean acidi acidification, for example, because that means you know you have to explain to the council. So for ocean health, they kind of get yeah. 
healthy fish, not destroyed. And, it, and it's this sort of easy thing to, to get behind. And they've really, really liked it. And now all of our cabinet reports have this, you know, this is the decision you're making. This is the impact that we have, that we expect it to make. And they can, they can go, oh, so what does this yellow bit mean? What does this mean? And, and, and the people are presenting it. They can ask questions of them. They're a bit more prepared for it. Um, so we haven't had any real trouble selling it. And from there, the use of this tool and the familiarity of this tool is now feeding like directly the structure of it, the, the, the different segments are now feeding directly into our top line policy. But at no point are we explicitly saying we are going to do donor economics that we don't that's it, it's more like it, it's definitely an, an adaptation of it. it's not the exact original economic thing because that's not quite what a local authority does is plan the economy of, a, of an area it has a hand in it but it's a lot more practical and, and people-based so so you so we never we, we never did sell it to them i mean they might be unaware and to, and to be fair we've got a whole new load of new councillors coming in now anyway we've just had a change of administration so we've got to brief the new councillors on this and again we're not going to sit there and say we're all about donor economics but <laughs> it's fundamentally in us in our strategy now <laughs> but, but i mean you show them the diagram and you don't have to call it donuts and as kate yeah. always said show them the diagram show them an illustration and you're halfway to winning them over which is yeah. which is really really important but how do you get them then to move from looking at the diagram, accepting it, seeing its potentialities, to then embedding it into every department of the council? Um, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so the, the decision wheel is now quite widely used across the council. Um, I, I say it was initially only at the highest level of decision making, but we, we've got a new version of it, which is a lot easier to use. It's all online and flashy and all that. And, um, that makes it a lot easier for people to use it. We've been training project managers up and the way that we really want to use this is not retrospectively at the end of the project planning process, like, oh, it's got to go to cabinet, do a wheel. We want to, we want to put it in the business case phase so that it's fundamentally there, helping to influence and, uh, the shape of policies and projects as they go forward right from the beginning um, so that people can sort of, what's the word, there's an ambition to make the wheel as green as possible, always being honest, um, but making, making, make, trying to, you know, like you, you set up a project and you go, oh, I hadn't really considered that about air quality or, or whatnot. So now I've, I've got to answer these questions and maybe I need to do some mitigations as I develop this project and policy and push it forward. Beyond that, our, our big sort of principal strategy documents for the organization, which, which talk about our values, and the way that we will prioritize everything in the future is it's called preferable war bath or skilling war bath we've got two of them that it's a corn, cornish words um but they themselves have gone to this wheel as a as like a starting point for how we articulate the values how we want to go forward so that's in our central in our in our core now we're rolling this out as well the decision wheel tool into things like budget setting so testing changes to our budget through it and into things like procurement uh, and commissioning so so that it, it extends or like these sort of values extend outwards through our influence into the wider economy of cornwall so you know, we have a lot of suppliers and and if we design a tender if it if we test the the service that we're designing against that wheel then it's sort of getting out there and what we ask people to provide for us so i mean uh apart from whether it's uh, to do with sustainability or whatever, it's an incredibly good model, isn't it? And you can tell me whether it succeeded in getting people to think outside of silos. It gives you a much more holistic approach to making decisions in Cornwall. People are not fighting over their silos in the way they might in other local authorities. Have you seen that happen in Cornwall? Have you seen them break away from their silos and make decisions in a different way? Yes, definitely. Um... It's not, I think, I think people expect whenever they bring in a, a new tool to, to what they're doing, that things will change overnight, but it's a subtle change that's not necessarily one that you'd immediately see. But when people are do, doing a wheel for their project uh, and they, they kind of come across a hole in the data, like, like there's an impact and they know it's there, but they've no idea what it really is. And uh, like, for example, our, our future estates plan here, which is looking at what, estate we want to have what buildings we want to have open how we use them where we might need to build new buildings which ones we want to close and sell um 
and and the effects of COVID over the last year in terms of people's working patterns and how we look at our working patterns, how much we work from home and whatnot. When making that decision, running it through the wheel, it was determined that we were most likely going to have quite a positive impact maybe on on climate change emissions because they had to answer the questions in the wheel like is this going to raise or lower your ghd emissions um but there was no way to accurately really answer that like it, nobody really understood what those impacts would be so the estate team are reaching out to both trans the transport team and the carbon neutral team to build some models to assess the, the hole in the data that, that showed up and and that's where it's really driving where it's really driving it across Cross department working is understanding that what they're doing probably is going to have an impact, but they have no idea what it is. So they have to ask around to be able to, to do this and they have to start working with other people in areas that they wouldn't have traditionally worked. Um, but as I said, it's subtle. It, it's not, there's, there's no sort of big handholder thing. And especially since most of us are working from home at the moment, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it cross, cross silo working is a little strange. But, but it's it, broad it, individual silos. That it, it's it's really quite interesting because how you get people to work together like that is is not always easy, and I mean how do you get these integrated decisions made? You could say you do it in cabinet, but cabinet's not always the best place to do it because they often discuss other political issues. Do you have a sort of task group, a sort of Praetorian card, who actually sort of sees this through this integration and 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 tries to get everyone to think in the, the donut way. I mean, how do you actually organizationally make it happen? Um, it, I don't, I, uh, Mark would be able to answer this one better. Um, as far as I know, there's no sort of overall coordination to, to make people think that way in particular, but <clears throat> because the don't, because the decision wheel is a required thing for initially one level of decision making not the highest level of decision making but it's being sort of phased in down those those decision making levels um because people have to do that it's sort of getting into their into their their general working practices anyway we have a tool which which effectively forces them to do that and it will force them to talk to people in different departments if they need to know things I, one of the most interesting psychological um effects of this though rather than it Rather than I think it, 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 it you know, it, it is reading across, across department working, but a really interesting um, psychological effect is that it's forcing people to, to confront um, their overt optimism about things and how damaging overt optimism can be in, uh, in decision making. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further. Like, um, nobody out there, this is a strange analogy, but nobody out there wants to think of their, of their child as being a murderer. It's, but you know that their child the thing that they've created can possibly have can possibly do bad things um, and this is the same when it comes to sort of projects and policies people pour their heart out into it and when they initially do a um, an assessment of it it's very very difficult for them to see that that they might be doing negative things donut economics has that built into it it says that that you are going to have to probably do some bad things to get a, a, a greater good overall um, but forcing people to, to go through that process where they critically assess the negative impacts of something that they're doing, which they think is overall good, is a very transformative process, actually. And because it's the negative things that we, we really learn from, um, they're, they're, but, but forcing people, and the wheel does force people to, to look at it. If you're going to answer those questions honestly about is it going to increase, I don't know, car journeys, there is going to be a negative there. Is it going to increase pressure on sewerage systems or, or aquifers or all this kind of thing if you're building a thousand houses and 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 just uh, like a good example is like if we if we look at building say a thousand homes we expect that to that to equate to approximately three quarters of a million additional car journeys per year if you build a thousand homes that's what you'll do but getting people to to factor that into their equations when they're looking at building homes this is the first time it's, it's really happened and, and sort of forcing them to go, oh, well, actually, yes, whilst we might provide housing for a thousand people, that's going to cause some serious issues for air quality or greenhouse gas so, so, So it becomes a good instrument for cultural change as well, which is, mm. which is really, really important. But, you know, we're talking about how Cornwall handles it in terms of the local authority, but you take it out to civil society as well, don't you? I mean, I looked at 
donuts and <laughs> donuts in Cornwall, apart from the the, the, the donuts. I got I found that lots of the, uh, civil society groups are beginning to use it as well. I mean, how have you sort of disseminated it out to civil society so they see its value as well? Again, this is a big one for Mark, but I'll, in his absence, and he, he, he can't join us, you may have realised by this point he's been trying, but he can't. Um, uh, we do have, we've mapped out um, the sort of layers of influence that the, that the council can have within within our society, from, from sort of the top levels where we set policy and we basically tell people what to do, and our own internal structure, which we have good control over. Beyond that, we have these various layers where we, say for example with commissioning i talked about this briefly before but but if we want to if we want to, to sort of further this idea we're not only going to have to design our services again testing them through our through the, the donut effectively you know is this is this going to be good for air quality what we're asking people to do um, but also upping what we require in terms of not just green credentials but solid plans from say suppliers that we have to do something about specific social justice or environmental things within the donut that we have, you know, within the service that we've, we've created that's tested by the donut to get them to sort of contribute to that in a way. So for example, we might ask them, depending on the size of the contract um, and the nature of it for uh, an inventory of their, of their greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't have to be a complicated one. And then a solid plan from them, not only how to improve their own, um, uh, organizational emissions but for but also say if they have any like as part of their tender response is there any way that they can see to innovate to make our proposal better than than we can like we realize we're not going to think of everything that makes to, to, to make a proposal better for social justice or the environment so as a requirement they're having to come back and say to us uh yeah and you know this is what we're going to do to further the sustainability of this or social justice outcomes of this particular tender so we're trying to extend it that way we we have used it in a few community fund applications so our community infrastructure levy fund uh we asked people who are bidding to do sort of environmental projects from from the fund that we had i think it's from landfill is the fund but um we asked them as part of their application process to complete a decision wheel and say what are the impacts according to this of your project what do you see being the the impacts so, sort of getting it out that way we do a lot of uh direct communication into the community and through things like the let but it's uh it, it's a little less coordinated um than say internally where we've been doing this um and, that's and what... i think we've been we've been largely waiting to make sure we're doing this right to really sort of push it out beyond our borders in a more coherent way well, and also it, trying to figure out how we do that yeah but but you know from what i've seen the, the ripples of it is going out into civil society and, and that that's really good and you you're, you're trying to create an inclusive partnership which is good mm -hmm. as well but i mean what, what what's your view of how it will develop going forward in cornwall i mean you talked about your cooperation with the University of Exeter, you're going to look at indicators and metrics in a more sort of profound way than you've been able to do a, a, up to now because you've had to get the basic model, you know, accepted and understood. So do you have a, a, an idea, of, a vision of how you're going to go, for, go forward on this? Uh, well, we, we are currently deep in, in the development, well, actually we're at the end of the development of our latest version of, of this model which is what we're going to use to to or our decision making tool so that we can extend that much more easily and much more readily down through the entire decision making process in the council um, and that's taken quite a while to be able to develop an, an app so it is an app that you can access it through our intranet rather than it being the old we've got an old spreadsheet which is what we used for, for the previous version of it but this will allow it people access to it we're also looking at this being an open source thing when it's developed hopefully no no firm decision on that but i think it's 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 going to be a part of our principles going forward that we're not looking to restrict what we do with this certainly our original version of this wheel with just basically a series of questions and a spreadsheet that's freely available and anyone can have that if they want to start basing 
Right. Okay, okay. Well, that no. sort of brings me to the last question because we've got to, to the end of this yeah. is anyone can see it, you said. So how do people find out more about what you're doing? And if they wanted to contact you, how would they? I mean, maybe you don't want too many because you get so many people, <laughs> you know, contacting you. But I mean, if people wanted to find out more, where would they go? What would they do? Uh, we do have some information on this on our website, but um, if for the public but but if someone from uh, um, especially a local authority or a large in institution wants to talk to us directly then then they can we have a, a climate change um, email address at the council which I'm sure I have somewhere <laughs> just give me a sec while well, I try and remember what that is um uh, Zen Mark would Mark would be better answering this one. Well, okay, you can send it to me, and I'll put it up. And oh, yeah, that's, that's probably that's probably probably best. But yeah, pe pe but yeah, I'd, I'd welcome people to to send me through uh, an email, and we can have a chat and possibly a talk uh, in the future. Um, and as I said we do have some stuff on the on on the website about this, but but now that we're finally getting our new version of this, the decision wheel out there, uh, and we are publishing a lot of our much broader like top level strategies in over the course of the next couple of months it's going to take contain a lot of information about this and sort of set out again not explicitly saying this is how we adopt donut economics but it it has a lot of those principles like built into it very obviously it's very much there um throughout the throughout the sort of organizational values that we will be will be going forward with so they can engage okay. it that way but as i said that's a little yeah. that's that's still a few weeks or possibly months yeah. off again not my not my department okay well you know um we'll follow what you're doing because it's really interesting and i like the way it's developing mm. it's a sort of developmental model and you're doing it incrementally step by step learning from it and we can learn from you and that that is you know really really important and i think lots of people will find it interesting so you know thank you for doing it and for answering mark's questions well as well as well as you probably would have given a lot better on no no I, yeah, I think you did really really well for that and, and and also your own questions which was great and i i mean it's given us an idea of how you're developing it i sure if we disseminate this as we will through Facebook and on YouTube, people will be really, really interested in it. So, I mean, it has been, I think, very enlightening. So thanks for doing it, Alex, and yeah. doing it uh, doing it solo as well. Um, right. you know, thanks for having me. Well, you know, thank you for doing it. Because I know you do it with so many people and that you make yourself open and available, I think is great credit to, to you and to Cornwall as well. So thank you for doing it. And we'll end this interview now. Thank you.